You've decided you're ready to become a parent, and suddenly you're overwhelmed with people who feel they have the right to inform you on the correct way to conceive, give birth, what fears you should have, and the proper way to parent. How do you filter through the opinions? How do you know what's trustworthy information and what's a myth or just plain outdated? Welcome to the Birth Ease Podcast. Join your host, Michelle Smith, and her guests as they cut through the noise and fear by sharing valuable tips, tools, and proven methods that help you connect with your own inner wisdom as you navigate the sacred journey that is pregnancy, birth, and parenthood in a more relaxed and confident manner. This podcast does not constitute, nor is it intended, as medical advice. Hello, Birth East families. Welcome to your reprieve from the noise and the stress that can often accompany pregnancy, birth, and parenthood. I'm your host, Michelle Smith. In today's podcast, I'm so excited to have a dear friend of my family's here with us, Mitchell Gerald. Mitchell is a former teacher and an artist, and he is going to be discussing the different learning and processing styles, the communication styles that all of us have, and how this can help us as parents and in our relationships. So welcome, Mitchell, to the Birthies podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm very excited to be able to just share a little bit about what I know and what I've experienced and how this has helped me in my life, whether with my self-growth or any sort of relationship, whether that's friends, family, or otherwise. Thank you. So I'm familiar with the different learning styles just from being a clinical hypnotherapist and also from homeschooling my kids all these years. So as it applies to hypnosis and we're working with imagining because some people say I'm not visual so I won't be able to do guided imagery because I can't see it in my mind and I'll often explain well you can maybe imagine feeling it or perhaps you hear it and you can get your senses involved that way. Or sometimes I'll tell people you don't necessarily have to see it because you can just think about it. We can all think about how much we love someone or think about our car if we have a car. And so there's these different ways of processing information And I'd really appreciate it if you could touch on those different styles and explain more in depth what they are, please. So in terms of communication and processing and comprehending information, there are a couple that really stick out for educational purposes, and that's auditory, visual, and kinesthetic learning. Those are three of the senses that a lot of us use. There's olfactory, but (laughs) we don't normally teach our kids how to smell things, um, so I can't touch too much on olfactory, but... And taste goes along with that. Well, interrupting you, but it does. And it actually is a very minor learning style, is taste and the olfactory. Well, yeah, people, people definitely forget about those two forms, but since play a huge role in memory and when it comes to learning and education at the end of the day it does come down to making that memory and making it an emotional connection so that you could pull back on whatever that information was to then help you in your life whether it's schooling and it's taking a test or remembering the next step that you have to do after you become a doctor, you have to create that memory in audio, visual, and kinesthetic learning. Understanding your process helps you get to that next step in your life, if that makes sense. It does. It does. So can you just define each of those for the listeners in case they aren't familiar with what kinesthetic or visual processing or learning would be? Audio, visual, and kinesthetic learning are just different types of processes in which we take information. So when I was teaching, whatever the lesson plan was, I would 
put it on the board or I'd put it on a laminate and project it up onto my screen. So all of the kids that were in the classroom were able to visually read it. So you've got your visual learning. I would also go up there and I would point as I was reading it out loud so that the kids could hear me saying it. And then when it came to the actual portion of kinesthetic learning, we would all be doing it tangibly with our hands, with our bodies. And then sometimes I would have them saying it out loud, but we'll go into that in a minute. But those are the different types of audio, visual, and kinesthetic learning. You have that movement, you're hearing it, you're saying it, and you're reading it or writing it. They all work hand in hand. And we tend to have a dominant one, but they can overlap. I know for myself, I'm very visual, but also very kinesthetic. And other people may be auditory kinesthetic, but we tend to have a main one, yes? Definitely. We have one that we all prefer. That said, it's hard to say this is what I am 100% because when we often give ourselves or others said label, then when it comes to a different learning style, it could be detrimental because then if you have labeled yourself as a kinesthetic learner, when an auditory process comes up, sometimes we might tend to check out of that learning style because we say, no, I know I'm kinesthetic and I don't I know it's not going to help me. And in those cases, it's not true to follow up on what you're saying because everybody is a specific blend of those learning types. How would that transfer into the classroom or a parent helping their child with their homework? How could knowing how to incorporate these different learning styles help their child or to understand them? Like for my daughter, she was saying that she really needs to, when she was reading and doing her homework, she needed to listen to loud music that she's familiar with because it would help distract all the sounds and help her to focus. She needed that to help her with her intake of the information, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. And this is a very broad question. And when it comes to answering that, you have to sit down and fully realize that outcome what it is you're trying to get to, and know your audience. So in order to tackle whatever subject it is, you have to formulate a proper strategy to get there. So let's take, for example, when I was teaching, I taught high schoolers, 9th to 12th grade, and they were all in the same class together. And some of my students didn't understand their primary and secondary colors. That's the composite of a rainbow. So you have blue, yellow, and red, your primary colors. And I told my students, it is not your fault. If you don't understand what we're doing, that's fine. It might have been the teacher prior. It might have been you. You might have slept through it. I don't know. I don't care. We're learning this together. So for the auditory, visual, and kinesthetic aspect, It comes down to making a memory. You're different parts of these things, so you have to make it personal. So I would say today we're going to learn about purple, however silly that might be. I would write down on the board purple. On one side I'd write blue, on the other side I'd write red. So you're seeing it, you're reading it, and then we're about to act it out. So I would have my students stand up. I would say, everyone stand up. We're going to walk over. We're going to rifle through our boxes. In our left hand, we're going to pull blue. In our right hand, we're going to pull red. And we're going to sit back down. Now we're going to look up at the board and we're going to say, purple. And this is high schoolers. So every single one of them are looking at me like I'm very silly. And that's fine. But we're going to say, red, blue, red, blue, purple red, blue, red, blue, purple. And then you're creating that memory. They all stood up. They tangibly grabbed these colors. They sat back down. They're reading it. They're hearing other people say it. They're saying it. They're thinking in their head about it, whether it's fun, whether it's silly, whether it's crazy. And at the end of the day, 
that's a win because you're hitting all these different types and sometimes you're not the parent or the tutor one-on-one getting able to figure out said student, said child's learning type. You have to hit all of these at once and really force that memory so that it helps them later in life to grow as a person. You don't have to stop and look up. How do you make said color? You know, because you had a silly moment in school. That makes so much sense to me, that you're incorporating all of these learning styles. And because even if the kids thought this is so stupid, that it created a memory and you're right, they're not going to forget it. Of course, they're going to sit at lunch and they're going to talk about how silly that class was why we're talking about purple and how to make these secondary colors. But at the end of the day, you win because they're talking about it. They remembered and then you can move on. And next time when you're doing a more complicated lesson plan, you don't have to go back and touch on, hey guys, okay, I'm only giving you these three colors. We're going to be doing this. I want you to make a purple sky. I want you to make blah, 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 what have you they're not going to stop and be asking these questions. You could get through that lesson plan and teach something that's going to help a more critical thinking aspect. Yeah, that could really be invaluable because it would teach children and young adults how to incorporate all these learning styles to increase their retention, to increase their memory. I had heard it said, if you really want to retain some information, if you can read along as someone else is reading it, or if you have an audio book, if you can read along with it, then it's going to help you retain the information more readily because the information is going in auditorily. You're doing it visually. And probably if you fidgeted while you did it, you would pull in all those senses. Correct. That's definitely one portion of it when you're talking about almost like a mixed media of learning styles. It's you aren't just one. It's pulling on different aspects of you to be present in this moment of receiving. Yeah. Yeah. How could this help us in our relationships if we understood how someone tends to process information or maybe not to get our feelings heard if our friend is listening to us, but they're fidgeting at the same time. I know sometimes even when I teach, the dads will be on their phone and their wives are really upset. And the dad's like, I'm really listening to you, but it's like he needs to fidget a little bit to take in the information. Correct. So a lot of us, I don't want to say we're quick to anger, but it's not understanding. And when people don't understand something and if people don't know what's going on, they get a little angry. And anger is not a bad emotion, but you have to take a second and really process why you're feeling that. And oftentimes, an example like that, let's say if the wife is getting upset, she might not be able to multitask that way and comprehend what you're saying, which is kind of a little silly because women are way better at multitasking (laughs) than men. But um, for a prime example is understanding the way you absorb information, process it, and then communicate it out in a way that I could give you an example. An old friend of mine, we were living together for almost a year And I realized that he was very quick to anger. So we were able to sit down and have, I'm not going to call it a conversation because his form of a positive communication was talking at me. So in order for us to feel quote unquote close, I wasn't necessarily allowed to talk. And he was the one doing all of the communicating because for him, me being quiet and listening was a part of that process. So whenever he was talking to me, if I would do any more than, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, sure. Oh, that's crazy. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. He would get upset. And it wasn't until later when I realized if we were playing video games 
or if we were sitting outside and smoking a cigarette, which I don't do anymore, but I'll come back to that later, or if we were inside and he was playing the piano and I was painting, we were able to have a really in-depth conversation about life or our day, and it got me wondering, why is it that sometimes we could have a really positive, enriching conversation that brings us together, and other days, he's just so angry? Well, I realized that was a part of his learning and communicating style. One day, we were sitting outside, and I told him how much the over-under was, how much I love him, how much I care about him, and how much he means to me. And again, I saw him getting angry, I saw him getting frustrated, and I was like, listen, I think I figured you out. This might be weird, but take my hand, I want to dance with you. Because he loved dancing. So I took his hand, and we stood up, and we walked onto his porch, and we started dancing. And I repeated the same notion, the same, I love you, I care about you, this is how much you mean to me, and I think I figured you out. And while we're standing there, and he's twirling, and we're dancing, you saw it in his eyes get really big. And I don't want to say watery like he was going to cry, but You've seen it in someone, you felt it in yourself when you're finally having that epiphany moment. And it scared him and he said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I said, I figured you out. You need to move. We need to be engaging in some sort of activity for you to really hear me and process what I'm saying. And it was a beautiful moment. And it was also a weird moment. But that, that moment I take with me to this day because it really helped reinforce, take the time to understand someone else. And if you care about them, figure out how they learn. That way you could better communicate. It makes me kind of teary because I'm thinking, what if we could do that with our children? When they're doing their homework or maybe they need to stand up and move or actually it was my 20 year old i remember now as we're talking when she would eat she would hardly sit in her chair she just had to stand and eat and it could make some people around her anxious but i just figured out that's what she needed to do it and as time has evolved that child of mine has figured out that she has, she feels like she has a little bit of mild ADD and she has dyscalculia and where numbers reverse and dyslexia. Uh And so that movement, that kinesthetic she has figured out has helped her. And I'm glad that I didn't yell at her all the time, you know, sit in your chair and be still. Yeah. Yeah. Like if we were in a public place, yes, but That memory just popped into my head as you were talking about that and how important it is to honor our children or my youngest. She's always been really active, but when she was in school, we'd go visit and I'd see her trying to sit there so good and hold her hands in her lap and behave. And then when she came home after school, because back then they weren't giving kindergartners recess, which I think is what? awful. Yes, which is awful. No. Yes. <laughs> That's blowing my mind. Yeah. Okay. Orange County was doing that no. here in Florida. And all the parents were getting really upset because our kids would come home and they would have so much energy. We Little lost kids. funding at my school a couple of years ago, too, and we got rid of agriculture. We got rid of culinary. It was, we got rid of band. It was awful. It was, yeah. I had so many kids in my art class, and I was like, you don't turn them away. You bring them into my classroom. Yeah. <laughs> they need an outlet, you know? Yes, yeah, it was crazy. But she would come home, and I would just let her... We have a big open living room, and I would just let her run circles and gave her a trampoline and gave her a way to get that energy out. And I think sometimes... It's just my opinion, but... We expect children to sit still for too long 
and most of the teaching, not everybody's fortunate enough to have a teacher like you that wow. incorporates these different learning styles and it can be difficult for them. Or... It is fairly detrimental because everyone, your brain, your mind runs a million miles a minute. Everyone does. You could think about any friend you've ever had and they're like, oh, well, I'm just always thinking. I'm just always thinking about something that's hard for me. Everybody is going through something. Mm -hmm. Everyone is. They're thinking about something. They're feeling something. They're doing something. Their mind's somewhere else. So if you're able to bring that student back into this moment of education, you're really going to help reinforce that memory. And that's what you're saying having that way to get that physical energy out at recess or even just being able to socialize that way get some energy out so that when you're back in the classroom it's a little bit easier to focus students now some students if they ask the teacher if they're allowed to stand during class well they could kind of bounce on their toes a little bit put them you know maybe in the back of the classroom that way they could kind of hop around a little bit and not be just one more distraction to the students who need to focus visually, but then you're able to help be there for the students in the way that they need. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's more individualized. It, it is a little more individualized. And when you have 30 plus students in your classroom, that can be overwhelming. As a teacher, I understand. I would have students come in during... We had three different lunches, so some of my classrooms would be full of 40-plus kids because my class was the fun class. And I didn't care why you were in my class. You were going to be doing my work. <laughs> so you weren't allowed to just come in my class and fart around if you were in my class, and maybe you should have been in math or maybe you should have been in another class. I wouldn't kick you out because at the end of the day, you were searching for something and it wasn't just a screw around classroom. It was a classroom where you were welcome, you had a voice and you felt like not only me, but the rest of the students were there for you. I would not allow bullying in my classroom. We were open to learning and communicating and that's so important when you're in those you know years of life where you just need to be seen if that makes sense yes and I think this circles back to some of the other podcasts we've done or conversations I've had on the importance of everyone really I feel has this maybe not everyone but most of us has this desire to be heard and to be listened to and to be seen, and to be validated. That doesn't happen. And a lot of people I'm finding don't really even know how to truly listen. Ugh, you're so right. So many, so many people don't know how to listen, and so many people don't know how to communicate. Mm -hmm. And that's a very big statement, but hold tight and ride with me. Someone that I love on TV, his name is RuPaul, he ends every one of his shows as, how are you gonna love somebody else if you don't love yourself? Right. So how are you gonna communicate with someone if you don't know how you communicate? How can you sit there and expect someone to process if you don't know how you process? So kind of circling back around to what you said about your daughter and how as a student she wasn't allowed to go out to recess how are you expected to learn i said earlier how i used to smoke and how i'd come back to talk about that i don't smoke anymore because i know how bad it is for you but i realized through smoking <laughs> and not because of smoking or that that's good for you or anything like that but <laughs> um i realized through that act of having something in my hand, thinking about, is the ash going to fall? Am I going to burn myself? What's going on? I was reading a book. 
and I had taken my students to the Dolly Museum here in St. Pete, Florida as just a normal field trip. I wanted them to have a little bit more culture in their life and I got this book about the golden ratio. I used to teach math and I used to teach art. So I thought, wow, what a fun way <laughs> to learn something new that incorporates both. So I had tried reading this book multiple times. I'm really great when it comes to an audio book because I'm an artist and for me specifically, I could sit and I could paint and listen to a book and fully absorb whatever that is whether it's fiction or nonfiction, because my hands are doing something and I'm engaging my brain in the art at hand, whatever that task is. But when it comes to sitting down and just reading a tangible book, even if it's fiction or nonfiction, it's hard for me to stay on task, but it's easier if it's fiction because my brain could at least picture the scene or the environment that's going on. Back to the golden ratio, it's very difficult for me to help educate myself to learn from nonfiction. So I was sitting here on the porch, I was smoking a cigarette, and I realized for the first time, I was probably 27, I want to say I was 26, 27 years old, I had read multiple pages fully absorbed these pages. I understood, I comprehended, I knew what was going on, and I didn't have to reread the same paragraph five times. I hadn't gone six pages and realized I hadn't read four of them. And I looked at this cigarette in my hand, and I said, what is happening? I must be partially visual and partially kinesthetic when it comes to processing literature. So I put that cigarette out and I said, I am never gonna smoke again. And I took my middle finger and my thumb and I just started rubbing those two together. And then I said, well, let me, let me try this. And I started reading and it was the same thing. I was able to read and comprehend just because I was keeping myself grounded in this moment and moving my fingers together. So bringing it back to your daughter, those fidget spinners, do I agree with necessarily bringing a toy into the classroom? Eh, I don't know, it might be a distraction. But one of your other daughters, she has a ring that spins on itself. That's not a distraction at all. Just having something like that on your finger to kind of play with. You're not gonna sit there and play with it like it's a toy and take all of your attention. It's a ring. <laughs> it's gonna stay on your finger and you could watch, you could hear, you could absorb what the teacher's telling you while you just flick this little ring as it goes in a circle. It gets some energy out and it keeps you locked in to this moment. And it's such a beautiful thing, but why? Did I have to wait until I was 26, 27 to figure that out on my own? How beautiful would it have been to have a teacher tell you that or help you, guide you to find that? Yeah, I think it's wonderful when we can explore these different learning styles and understand ourselves and understand our children and to not make one style of learning superior to the other. Correct. And to understand that the ways of processing can overlap. And as you were talking, from a hypnosis point of view, when you're reading and you start to lose those words, what's happening is your brain is going down into those lower brain waves and you're going into this more meditative state, I would say. It's just going into those lower brain waves. And so it's kind of a state of everyday hypnosis, kind of like when you drive down the road and you think, oh my gosh, how did I get here already? <laughs> yeah. You're not in your critical thinking mind anymore. Your subconscious is driving the car. And as you're reading, you're slipping into that daydreaming state and your brain waves are going lower. You start thinking about other things if that makes sense. Of course it does. And I've never 
thought about it like this until this conversation. So I think part of even the fidgeting, it helps keep you in the present. It does help you keep you. It does help to keep you in that present moment because I was able to take that just rubbing my two fingers together for a while. I was super self-conscious about it. I'm 30 now, so a while, you know, three, four years. Um, When I'm talking to someone and they're trying to explain something to me, we're all human sometimes it is very difficult to pay attention Mm -hmm. i'll put my hand down to my side or just kind of under my leg or behind my back and i'll start spinning my fingers together to help me comprehend and understand i care about what people are saying and i want to be there with them they're not just talking for their health they're talking because they want me to be there with them They want to share that experience and that might be how they express that through words. Some people might express it through painting, but knowing myself and how I pay attention, it's done wonders for my social life, my friendships, my relationships, because I'm able to ground myself and be there. It makes so much sense. It does. And Earlier, we were chatting and just talking about how we can even process our emotions. Some people do it through speech. Some people do it through writing. My older daughter, I think she moves emotion through dance and Mm -hmm. movement and exercise. Again, it's just becoming aware of how our processes are to move through emotion And like we discussed earlier, information tends to get coded more powerfully if there is a lot of emotion around it. So if we're wanting to remember something, scent can help because we're pulling in more, more senses, movement, having kids jump up and down while they're learning something like you were having them do. Even when, yeah, even when I was an elementary PE teacher. Almost everything that we did with those kids, I would incorporate it with math. I would assign people numbers and then I would give them just addition or subtraction and at the end of the year multiplication or division. I would give them problems that they would have to figure out as a group. Okay, if you're number four, I would call two plus two. And then they'd all be like four, four, four. And then it was a fun way to do it. Right. You know? And for kids, I think the more you can incorporate that fun and play, because that's really how they learn, Yeah, is through play in so many ways. But I think even for adults, it's good information. If you're trying to retain something, if you want to create memory, smelling rosemary, it helps access memory. And strong scent is one of the quickest ways to access memory. Of course. And learning these ways to help incorporate the meaning and the learning is really invaluable. I completely agree. Just making learning fun is, I'm going to use your same word, invaluable, but it's going to be difficult if you don't take the time to learn about yourself first in order to help someone else. Because the way we communicate Not everyone is great at communicating with words. Some people are better at communicating with images. When it comes to art, I've had some teachers tell me exactly what to do with my paintbrush. I've had some teachers (laughs) with the paintbrush, they make it's gotta go like like that. And they're just making noises. Some people could tell me the perfect angle the perfect motion with words. Some have to do it with sound. Some of them, nope, I don't, just give me your paintbrush. I don't know what, I don't know how to tell you. And they could only show me. And it's funny when you, uh, I don't know if it's funny, haha, but it's interesting when a different student asks a teacher who's only good at acting it out, painting it. They have to come, they have to take the paintbrush, they have to show you. But the student that doesn't understand that movement visually, they have to hear it. They ask that question and your student is lost because they can't see it or feel it the way that 
the teacher who's only good at acting it out is able to communicate it. So if you don't know yourself and if you as a teacher don't understand what it is you're doing and why you're only capable of tangibly acting it out, you're not going to be able to say, oh, wait, let me understand. This is my arm. It's holding it this way, blah, 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 blah. Now I'm going to go write that down so that when the student that asks me, but what are you doing? I've felt myself in my body connecting with the canvas through the paintbrush. What is going on? And now I've written it down so that I could read it if I have to, to the student who has to hear it. Does that make sense? It does. So if you don't know yourself, how are you going to take the time to then translate it to someone who needs a different form of comprehension? Do you know? Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not being super eloquent, but I get passionate sometimes about (laughs) these things. Maybe I should write it down. It's, but it's good. It's such a big, big subject and we're trying to distill it down. I think being aware of these different styles of learning and comprehending, even understanding our environment, the way we process it is so important. If you had one bit of wisdom or advice or a thought that you would really want to convey to the listeners about these different learning or processing styles, what would that be? I think the biggest takeaway would be to not get frustrated. It's very easy to get frustrated when you're learning something new or trying something new. One of my favorite authors, Brandon Sanderson, talks about how the most difficult aspect of any journey is the first step. And then later he goes back to refine that and says the most difficult aspect is not the first step. It's every step after that. You have to choose to take the next step. You have to choose to work harder to understand yourself. You have to take that conscious effort to better yourself so that you could help better your child, so that you could help better your friends, your relationship, your community. So the only words of wisdom I would say is to not get frustrated, take a breath, and tackle a different aspect about your own learning so that you could help your life flourish and so that you could then connect with other people around you in a more positive, enriching, fulfilling way. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I'm kind of teary because I feel like the most important thing that we can do for our children our partners, ourselves, is to continue to do our own self-work, our yeah. own self-growth, to be really committed to that, and ideally to begin doing the work before we become pregnant or become parents, and to make that commitment for growth in all of our relationships. That's the best thing. Because it's not, can... it's not selfish. It's not selfish taking the time to love yourself and care about yourself. Mm-hmm. It's not a bad thing to do that, to then share what you've learned through introspection to others. Do you know what I mean? I do. I do. I had this big awareness oh, maybe a couple of years ago. My elder daughters around your age, and when we were parenting 30-something years ago, it was part of this movement that we realized, oh my gosh, the way we were parented is so harsh and really, really damaged our self-esteem in so many ways. So we strived to improve our children's self-esteem. And in many ways, that was really good. And I think we made some errors along the way, you know, of our children in some ways have become more externally motivated instead of internally motivated, but that's a whole nother subject. But what I realized is you cannot give what you do not have. 100%. 
and we were working to heal our own self-esteem and to learn we were I feel like we were on that cutting edge of it in a way and learning to be kinder to ourselves and learning to love ourselves and you can't instill that in your children when you hate yourself correct and so part of this work is that self-acceptance that you're talking about and being kind to ourselves um, you know, I'm going to be really vulnerable and say that when I turned 50, I had this awareness of, I don't know how much more time I have on this planet, but I want to do a better job of being kind to myself mm -hmm. because of the way I was brought up, the time I was brought up in, the trauma I incurred in my childhood. I... It's just very mean to myself. And I think a lot of us are. We will say things to ourselves we would never, never say to anyone else. Right. And I feel like that whole sins of the father are visited on the children happens when we don't heal our own worth. We pass down those what word do I want? That self hatred yeah. almost. Am, am I making any sense? You are making sense. Um, everybody feels those things. And it's okay to get frustrated. It's okay to have that little voice because you can't hate yourself and you can't stop and you can't say, I give up just because those things happen. But you can choose to feed into that. You can choose whether or not you're going to dwell and live in that space but in terms of self-growth and awareness and how I work and communicate you go through those moments of what did this person do to me how did I act how did I react and what am I gonna do in the future if and when a similar case happens so if you realize I didn't communicate properly. I was hurting here. I didn't process this information. The next time that happens, you have to know yourself and have taken the time to understand yourself and say, I did it this way and that didn't work. Let's try it. Let's take a different route. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know that because you're hurting, because you haven't dealt with it, how are you going to take in new information how are you going to process it how are you going to communicate in the future if you haven't evaluated your past and you don't know how to evaluate the now does that make sense it does it does and i feel like too sometimes we expect our children to have emotional control that sometimes we as adults don't have of course but that's a whole nother subject but even just when we have made a mistake just to own it and say I didn't handle that well how could how could I have done that differently how would have that worked better for you be vulnerable enough to have those kind of conversations absolutely yeah so thank you so much for being here you're so welcome thank you for having me thank you all for listening Hopefully this sparks some thought and deeper ways to communicate and understand yourself, your partner, your child. We will find some links on the different learning styles in case you want to investigate it. And do some of your own research for sure. Thank you. For more great conversations like these, or to find out more information and access Michelle's library of amazing guests, Go to birthdeeservices.com forward slash podcast. For more information on the birthdees method, Michelle's classes, meditations, and other services, go to birthdeeservices.com. <laughs>